At least what the recruit said wasn't about USC. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thank you for making Locked On USC, part of the Locked On Network, your first listen every day. Whether you're watching the show on YouTube or wherever you want to download your podcast, this show is always free, and never forget how much I appreciate your support. USC fans, listen up. Listen to this. They're definitely still involved, but uh, i got to see what they're doing this season because it looks good at fill in the blank. Things are always going to look good, but I know, I want to see what they're going to do this season. And none of us know what's going to happen. End of the quote. So yesterday I was watching an interview with Hilton Stubbs. And he said something that literally sent a cold shiver down my spine. I knew exactly what he meant when, when the words he didn't use. Um, it's because USC was dealing with this the same exact issue these last couple of years, last few years, uh, until Coach Riley fixed his mistake on defense. Two things. When Stubbs said they're definitely still involved, but... Okay, number one. Whenever you say, but, you're getting ready to contradict whatever you said pr uh, prior to the word, but. Stubbs' body language, when I was watching the interview, really uncomfortable. He was going through a lot of mental gymnastics, trying not to say. This is what he was trying not to say, but he said it anyways. This staff, Florida staff, they might, they might not even be around at the end of the year. That's, for all intents and purposes, what he was telling the person asking the question. Why USC all of a sudden became the place to be. Florida was his leader. Um, so it, it was everything he didn't say. It was, you know, he he has no confidence in what's going on in Gainesville right now, essentially. Uh, before Stubbs committed to USC, he was, I guess, he was committed a heavy lean to the University of Florida. The four-star safety committed to USC after he took that unofficial visit a few weeks ago. Uh, he was part of that recruiting bonanza uh, that, that weekend that, that landed, you know, Justice Terry flipping from Georgia, Isaiah Gibson committing to USC, Gus, Gus Cordova, the other defensive lineman from the state of Texas. So I brought that up. I wanted to set the stage here for what I want to talk about in this segment, about the offensive line and recruiting. And the, so the reason why I use the Drake, the Hilton Stubbs uh, anecdote is because the way he talked about why he's, He's still interested in Florida, but he's not really. On yesterday's episode of Locked on USC, I started to get into the, the challenges with the offensive line route. Uh, when does the offensive line recruiting explosion start? I, you know, I, I kind of threw a little bit of shade uh, talking about all the commitments uh, that were coming in. You know, you got defensive line, you've got linebackers, you know, defensive secondary guys, wide receiver, running backs, three of them. The only position group that hasn't had anybody saying, hey, I want to be a Trojan, it's that offensive line room. So what what if, again, it's it's a it's a what if scenario. What if USC's offensive line, the recruits that they're going after, what if those guys are in a wait and see mode? You know, take this into consideration. With USC's offensive line room, it's it's deep and it's young. It's got Coach Riley, Coach Henson, they recruited 10 high school linemen in the last two cycles, 2023 and 2024 combined. So I'm wondering, you know, if that's playing a role with the prospects who are, you know, who are considering USC for this recruiting cycle. You know, is it a is it about the the roster's young depth? Uh, or, or, you know, do they need to see, you know, the players develop? Is that what, you know, this next batch of recruits want to see? I think if 
people are looking, well, you know, there's been a lack of development. Well, I think that has more to do with the, the amount of youth <laughs> that's going on in the room. Um, you know, and the, and the transfer portal guys, you know, it's not so much, look, they didn't have time to be developed with Coach Henson. I think Emmanuel Prignon is the outlier because he's, he's coming back. He's got, you know, this year, I think he also is next year, um, he still has some more eligibility. So the previous guys that USC's brought in through the transfer portal, they've been one-year guys. So the last thing we want are offensive line recruits looking at USC's room like, you know, Kilton Stubbs is looking at Florida. So I guess we're going to know real fast, right? I, I, again, you know, is it, are, are the offensive line recruits hesitant because they're not seeing development with the older guys? Um, you know, I, I think, we're, like I said, we're going to know real fast. The guys who were recruited in the class of 2023, they're being asked to be ready this year in 2024. So their their redshirt season is over. <laughs> they have to be ready. And, you know, I talked about this, um, you know, Lincoln Riley, you know, he had some pretty blunt commentary following Saturday's practice. And again, if you missed yesterday's episode of Locked on USC, quote, your older guys, your leaders have got to play their best. They got to be great leaders. They've got to set the tone. And I think at times last year, that did not necessarily happen all the time. He was talking about the offensive line. So among those guys, a, a few of the veterans who played last season, you know, those guys are gone. You know, the Jarrett Kingston uh, of the world. But you've got Jonah Monheim returning. You've got Mason Murphy returning. You've got Emmanuel Pignon returning. Gino Quinones is returning, hopefully healthy by the time fall camp arrives. Those are your guys with the most experience. So let me break it down for the, the guys who they've recruited through the high school port. High, through the high school ranks, I should say. Uh, you know, if you're concerned about development, okay. This is Josh Henson's third year. Well, he's going into his third year with the program. Jonah Monheim is the poster child for offensive line development at USC. Think about it. He's been developed to play every single spot on the line. Both tackles, both guards, and he will be the starting center in 2024. And again, Josh Henson's going to have him for a third year. You got to give him some credit, right? What about Elijah Paid, part of the 2023 class? He's penciled in to be the starter at left tackle. Yeah. He's a Henson guy. He got here in the spring of 2023. Alani Noah, class of 2023. He was your starting right guard in game one. Now, if he's able to hold off Gino when he returns, that put another feather in Josh Henson's cap. It's a dirty, grimy-looking cap, so let's put some feathers in it. <coughs> By far, Coach Henson, Coach Henson has the hardest working hat on that coaching staff. Let's see if I can get his and put it right next to Clay McGuire's. Uh, and if you know, you know. You Some people understand what I'm going there. So again, if... if Prion actually holds off Gino. Is that a good thing for someone who's looking for transfer portal development? Yes. But I, you know, I think it's hard to gauge the guys who have come in as one-year rentals. I don't know if we could hold that against um Josh Henson. But this is the, you know, this is the year. The spotlight is going to be, it's going to shine pretty brightly on that offensive line room and Coach Henson. Again, it's not throwing shade at him. I'm kind of just saying, hey, look, this is a situation. we got to talk about it. And again, it has more to do with the recruiting side of things. I'm not questioning the job Coach Henson is doing with the guys on the roster. This is strictly about recruiting. I mentioned at the top, Hilton Stubbs. He's still interested in Florida, but he's not really. Our offensive line guy is still interested in USC, the recruits, but are they in wait and see mode but for a different reason?
It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and really easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com forward slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Are you watching Fox Sports, ESPN? Is your TV just locked on Fox, ESPN all day? That's all you do. You, you watch sports. But do you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked on Sports today. A free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest sports stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team, every day. All right, I'm going to stay on the same tangent. We're going to continue talking about development. Uh, you're looking at the, uh, the, the rundown there, and it says, Star Chasing is Disappointing. Let me tell you why, where I'm going with that, what the context is. Been talking a lot about the linebackers recently, what Eric Gentry said, how he's so much happier, how the coaching staff knows how to use them, where to play them, what they're doing. Here's what Coach Matt Enns had, you know, what he said Monday night. Uh, He was on the Trojans radio live, the Trojans live radio show. Uh, They do that every Monday night. And he had a few things to say. Um, The first thing he wanted to make sure everybody understood, and I quote, Coach Hans, I am a uh, a (laughs) developmental coach. Man, I think I'm developing a speech problem. Anyways, Coach Hans is a developmental coach. And he talked about how chasing stars can lead to disappointments at times don't worry <laughs> he's not opposed to getting the four and five star guys he said usc is still going to get those guys mm-hmm. remember he's already got one on his you can put on uh, you can notch up his belt right tagawai it's one <laughs> however you know when it comes to building a roster Coach Entz, he said he wants guys who love the game of football. He wants guys who want to stick around for three or four years and be developed. Guys who are intrinsically motivated, who have that internal drive to want to get better, to take the time to learn. On the same token, you know, he's not opposed to the transfer portal, uh, but he did say they they have to be the right fit. he, you got the sense that he definitely prefers the, the high school recruit. But at the same time, you know, when I'm, you know, dissecting what he was saying, breaking it down, I think if we're being honest, the reason why he probably prefers it, and I think he probably wants to say true to heart as well, that's all he knows. Um, you know, being the head coach at North Dakota State, I'm sure there were some guy that transferred in on occasion, transferred out on occasion. But Fargo, North Dakota is not a destination point (laughs) Uh, as far as elite D1 players wanted to go be developed, right? There's a reason North Dakota State plays at the FCS level. Now, just because, you know, Coach Entz stepped down from being a two-time FCS national championship head coach, at North Dakota State, uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, he's not competitive. He said so. He says, look, I'm a competitive guy. That's why I'm here at USC. But just because he stepped down from being a head coach, that doesn't mean that he doesn't still speak up when he sees something that he needs to speak up about. Um, look, he's in charge of the linebacker room, but he said this. During practice, like when they're doing their um, 11 on 11 um, stuff, if he notices that someone on the defensive line isn't doing their job, he said, I'll call them out. 
he was he was talking about accountability, you know, with the staff and the players. He, he used an example like where if if a double if a defensive lineman gets double teamed, and then someone from the linebacker group messes up, he said, "Well, that's bad defense," and he doesn't care who's calling out the bad defense. Just get it corrected. So, um, it, essentially, it's a it, it's a group effort as far as you know. Hey, it doesn't matter who is chewing who out. If you see it, say something. See something, say something. Just don't stand back and wait for somebody else to do something about it. <laughs> oh, I, I found this interesting. You know, because I, I brought this up and I figured, you know what? Who? And I, I've I've I framed it this way. Who is the Ed Orgeron on the coaching staff? You know, the loud guy, the guy who's just chewing people out. So uh, the, the guys, you know, who are hosting the, the Trojans live show, Sean Cody and Jordan Moore and Max Brown, they asked uh, Coach Ants, you know, who's the, who's the loudest dog out there? And he said, yeah, who's the loudest dog on the staff? I don't know if they were referring to just the defensive side of the ball, but Coach Ants said it. it Sean knew it. I thought, all right, cool. I'm good with that. I can see it. Um, you know, co let Coach Kenny be the, the good cop who, you know, keeps it real, talks softly, but very serious. And, you know what? If, and if, if Coach Sean Nua wants to be out there calling dudes out, even better. He's been here the longest. He probably knows. He's probably more frustrated than anybody else besides Lincoln Riley. Because he's the one who they asked to stick around on that side of the ball, right? Oh, I love this part. Um, he's you, you gotta love the way he you gotta love the way Coach Ents coaches. He's just a he is a coach, he's a dude. Um, he says, Look, when I tell my guys that they're getting better, that's what it means. It means you're just doesn't mean you're good, it just means you're better than you were. <laughs> and it was just the way the, the matter of fact, the way he said it. So yeah. We're always working to get better. Doesn't mean you're good yet. Just means you're better than you were. He also offered uh, a better understanding, some insight into the slow install philosophy that uh, Danton Lynn has. That's it, it's been brought up a lot. So he he used the uh, the walkthrough um, scenarios. He said each walkthrough is actually situational. There's like three walkthroughs going on at the same time and you just rotate. So, you know, you can go from a pressure set to they have their base set. You got your under two minute situations. So you're constantly learning the same thing, but they're learning it under different circumstances. So look, as Coach Helton would say, right? Situational mastery. That's, this is what the slow installation is all about. They're doing the same thing over and over again. They're just doing they're doing it slightly different under different circumstances. But at the end of the day, they've done the same thing over and over and over again until they get it right. Uh, he, again, he talked about he came to USC. Uh, he's a competitive guy, and he's using USC as a stepping stone. He wants to get to the be a head coach at the FBS level. The same level USC plays at. And he said he chose USC because of its brand. You know, being that competitive guy that he is, he knows that the power of USC is going to help him eventually reach his, his head coaching goal, whether it's, you know, in college, professionally, whatever. He chose USC because of USC's brand. Eric Musselman. He was also on the show, Trojans Live. He talked about USC's brand. I'm going to talk about that next. All right. So, like I said, Coach Musselman, um, he was on the Trojans Live radio. 
I guess we call it the radio show. Um, and he talked about the different factors that went into his decision and why he left Arkansas to come coach USC. And he, he actually listed off four things. Number one, first thing he mentioned was it was Jen Cohen's vision. And it wasn't just her vision for the basketball program. It was her vision for all of USC athletics. And that made a big impression on, on Coach Musselman because he had some of the same uh, same visions. They, they aligned with each other. And something else uh, that Jen Cohen did that really impressed uh, Coach Muss, uh, he scored, she scored some bonus points because she included his wife in the interview process on Zoom. She made, Jen made sure that uh, his wife, Char Charlene, Charlene, Charlemagne, I apologize, I'll remember it the next time, um, that she got to, you know, ask some questions, make sure that she was comfortable with the move. So that impressed uh, Coach Moss that her opinion mattered that much. Second thing he said, USC's brand. Quote, the power of USC is really strong. Look, <laughs> um, that's, you, you hear that often. You hear that often. You heard it from Coach Entz. You're hearing it from Coach Musselman. Uh, he also said because USC's program um, has so much potential, he said he has it has a ton of potential. The reason he left a program that was selling out every game, 19 to 20,000 per game, um, he said USC should be able to do that too. It has that same type of opportunity. And the fourth thing, the fourth factor. Well, look, let's just say that the fact that his daughter is ready to be a freshman in college didn't hurt his interest in coming back to California, move back to Southern California. She gets a great education for free. And he wrapped it up by saying, look, it's a dream job for me, all things considered. <clears throat> so, you know, I, we talk about USC's brand. You know, the power of USC is really strong. <laughs> Think about it this way. <laughs> Who would have known that USC's coaching change in basketball would set off a domino effect like this? So Andy Enfield leaves. He goes to take over the SMU job, be part of the ACC conference. USC goes out and says, hey, Coach Eric Musselman, you want to come take over USC's program? A basketball program, you're leaving, which you'd be leaving a basketball program at Arkansas that has more accolades than USC. USC's program has a lot of history, a lot of tradition. Last time I went to the Final Four, 1954. They've never won a national championship. Arkansas has got a couple of those. So USC says, all right, you know what? Our brand and our program is strong enough now that we can entice. Eric Musselman to leave Arkansas, come to USC and try and build that pro build USC's program into what he did over there. And in turn, he left Arkansas's program in such a good situation, such a good position, that it looks like John Calipari is going to leave Kentucky to take over the job that Eric Musselman left behind. Wow. No, no, that's impressive to me. And just to remind everybody, USC in basketball, they're undefeated versus Kentucky. 4 0? Yeah. Last time they beat them was the, I, what, 2000, 2001, the uh, Sweet 16 game. That team, Sam Clancy, Jeff Trapanye, Brandon Granville. That team was supposed to be in the Final Four that year. And then they got duped in the Final Eight, in the Elite Eight. Duke, the referees. Oh, that game still pisses me off. Anyways, moving forward. It's been a long time. It's been 20 years. Get over it, Mark. So he, he talked about how he's going to build the roster. Uh, Coach Musk said he's looking for guys who are in the six foot five to six foot eight range across the board. He wants long athletic guys, guys who can play multiple positions. Uh, he said he wants to employ a an attacking style on both defense and offense. 
uh, aggressive. He wants guys getting to the free throw line. So you're not going to see much of a change in philosophy from Andy Enfield to, to Coach Musselman in that regard. They both employed that type of style. Uh, the reason why he has to hit the transfer portal hard, it's too late to use the high schools uh, this late in the uh, process you know, to build the roster this year. Uh, but he said it's going to be extremely important going forward. And he said, look, I don't even need to leave Southern California's footprint to, to put together a roster. Uh, but if you want to win big, you need to get those five-star NBA players. And look, LA, Southern California, Plenty of those guys playing hoops in the high school ranks. Plenty of them. But when he does go to the transfer portal for this roster, he says he wants two of everything. Point guards, off guards, small forwards, power forwards. <clears throat> he did meet with the uh, the guys who were still around on the team who were in the transfer portal. I guess, same thing. Um, he let them know, you know, what he has hopes for. And, you know, we'll see who sticks around. I'm not sure anybody will, but we'll find out. Well, he knows that he's going to be rebuilding a new roster. He knows the challenges ahead of himself, but he's a competitive guy. He's, he's ready to take on the challenge. I also have a feeling that, uh, and, he, and he actually said, because I love a challenge. <laughs> so that's his goal, to make USC basketball to what it was he left in Fayetteville. Get them on that same level of, of Arkansas. Um, I'll tell you what, he's going to be great for anecdotes, for stories. Uh, number one, if you don't, if you, for those of you who don't know, Eric Musselman is the son of a basketball coach. His dad, Bill, uh, coached in college, in the NBA. I want to sit down with Coach Musselman and listen to him tell some stories. He used one anecdote on the uh, Trojan Live show. He was talking about when he was a ball boy, when his dad was the head coach for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And he told his dad one day, you know, that, you know what, I want to be the ball boy for the other team, for the opponent when they come visit Cleveland. So for those 41 home games, I want to be on, in the other locker room. At the time, you know, he was learning how to coach. His His dad maybe didn't realize it at the time, but, Coach Russ was talking about how, you know, back then, that's when I was learning. Going into another team's locker room and, and, and kind of, you know, hearing different ways of doing things, getting, you know, from the, from the opposition, not just hearing it from, his, from his, the, the lens of his dad coaching. So he knew way back then that, you know, this is what he was going to be doing. There was times where he was learning how to coach and, Neither he or his dad knew they were learning from each other at the time. And the other thing that I really want to get into with him, um, he was talking about some family dinners that he had growing up in San Diego. So I guess some of his neighbors were Paul Brown family, same Paul Browns at you know, football, NFL. Yeah. He talked about having dinner with Billy Martin. Tell you what, sign me up for a dinner with Billy Martin anytime. I know that can never happen, but. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I want to sit down with Coach Muss and hear some of those stories. And they probably have to be off the record because I'm thinking, man, would I have loved to just hung out with Billy Martin and Tommy Lasorda for two hours. Colorful language, the stories. So I imagine that Coach Muss has some stories that he can tell. All right, there you go. Another episode of Locked on USC in the books. USC spring practice tomorrow. Well, actually, if you're watching this first thing Tuesday, I'm going to practice. I'll have a practice report on the next episode of Locked on USC. So until then, everyone, you know what to do.